when my dad would drop us off to see our mum, as you see the old sites that you recognise as landmarks so we're nearly there, my brother would start crying. And then when we would get closer and closer, it's like it would... It snowballed and the feelings and the feeling getting the stomach of having to part from one and go to the other because you'd become rooted again, especially if the time you had with either parent was nice. And then as you would go towards the transfer, it would get worse and worse and worse. And then when you would finally be handed over. When the divorce is going on, it's, it's very, it takes over your entire life. It's like you're riding through a storm. Sometimes, when parents split, the children are caught in the middle, pawns in a never-ending battle. The parents are splitting, but the children are torn apart too. Although divorce rates in this country are falling, more and more parents are going to court to fight over their children, despite the lack of legal aid. 80,000 children a year are affected by battles in the family courts. Sam is now in his early 20s, but he's still struggling with the legacy of his parents' bitter divorce. They separated when he was seven and spent the next nine years fighting over their two boys in court. Things got so bad that Sam ended up completely separated from his mother. It came to a, a bit of a physical altercation. And because both parents were stacking evidence against each other, that was the last piece that was needed. And after that happened, the altercation, we stayed with our dad for a while. It overran and we kind of lost track of the time and stayed and stayed and stayed. And I know for a fact that it really cut her deep that we didn't see her for so long. I think it was just under three years, but yeah. Were you ever persuaded that they were actually a bad person by the other parent? Yeah, completely. And they would paint the grossest caricatures of one another that would be so ridiculous and absurd. Mum came back once drunk and we were a little bit scared. But my dad found out about this and he was like, oh, she's out whoring herself and all this kind of thing. And then my mum would say the same about my dad and say he just wants to break up this family because he's sick of us all. He's a philanderer, everyone knows it and stuff like this. So I think to be made privy to things that are kind of sexual at that age, just as a really vicious attack on one another. It just tastes wrong at the time and it tastes wrong now when I think back at it. It's a back and forth that you can never really settle in one place comfortably or hold one view because you're just kind of a vessel for your parents' beliefs at any given time. After three years of total separation, Sam and his mother are now trying to build a new relationship. In fact, after this interview, he went off to meet her to spend the day together. But you can hear the sadness that goes very deep, even years later. Many of the people I see in my work as a psychotherapist are still struggling with the legacy of a bitter divorce. And sometimes the rift is permanent and the children refuse to see their mother or their father ever again for no good reason, believing the other parents' lies and repeating them, amplifying them to anyone who'll listen. There's a name for this unjustified rejection of a parent by a child, parental alienation. It's a label coined in America. Dr. Amy Baker is one of the leading researchers in this field. She's conducted studies all over the world on the long-term effects. So it did turn out that the people I interviewed felt that it was a very, very damaging, painful experience that had lifelong consequences for them. They talked about being depressed, hating themselves, having low self-esteem, having difficulties trusting other people because they had obviously been lied to and manipulated. They had difficulties trusting themselves. They said things like, well, if my mother could trick me, if I was so stupid, this is how they felt, that I could hate a parent who didn't do anything to me, then how do I know I won't be tricked again? How can I believe anybody? How can I trust my own instincts or intuition about whether people are safe and truthful? In some parts of the world, Brazil, Romania, some states in Mexico, parental alienation is a criminal offence. And increasingly, the concept of parental alienation is gaining traction in the courts here too. 
I've come to Lincoln's Inn Fields, the heart of legal London, to a shiny new office building to meet Francesca Wiley QC. She spent years representing parents in the most difficult separations, cases often involving allegations of parental alienation. Within the family court, it certainly has been quite a radical label to attach to any case until two or three years ago. So I don't know the answer to when the psychiatric and academic research actually started to gain purchase in the UK, but I know that within the court structure, you're talking about a sea change or the beginnings of a sea change in the last couple of years only. And before that, you had to be careful because it was seen as a red herring. It was seen as something that often fathers' groups would leap onto. And then you had mothers' groups on the other side shouting, well, actually, he's a domestic abuser. You're just using that to try and mitigate your way out of a very difficult position. But what I would say is that I have a number of women who I represent at the moment who are the victims of alienation. That's changing. It's no longer dads versus mums at all. Certainly not in my case, though. Last autumn in Sweden, lawyers, psychologists and therapists gathered at an international conference on parental alienation in Stockholm. There was a group of parents sitting at the back, scribbling notes, desperate for help. Among them, two mothers. One woman was wearing a large pendant with a photograph of a young girl. It's a picture of my daughter. It's one of the last pictures. Every second, every second of my life, mm. I think of her. She was uh, living with me because her father didn't want her. He left us when she was four months. So I was uh, alone with her, all of her upbringing. Then one day he started to fight for custody. Uh, he got a, a wife and I think they wanted a child together. Although the court ruled at first that this mother should have access after the parents separated, it was the child's voice that was listened to. Yeah. He had notes from her in court that said, I hate my mom. Sometimes I want to kill her because she's annoying. Once in all of these years, the social service took her into the room and the father was with her and they said, do you want daddy to be here? And she said, yes. <laughs> she was 10 years old. And they said, do you want to live with mom? And she said, no, that's it. And um, I, I opened an Instagram account because I know she has Instagram. And I only have it because I want to, I, I, everything I put there is for her so she could see it. It's the only thing, I cannot send letters, I cannot email, I cannot phone her, I cannot do anything, so I, I have this account. And a year ago, I started to tell the school, please tell her that I have this account. And after half a year, I asked them again and again and again, did you tell her? And they said, well, oh, yes, yes, I did. She started to cry. Okay, yeah, and then I talked to her dad, so now we decided that we'll never again mention your name. I'm living in a in limbo, in a grey zone. My life died when she left six years ago, and it's not a real life. I'm just faking it. After the recording finished, this mother said that she often had thoughts of suicide. Her friend Karen, who is with us, begins to cry. Her son cut her off and went to live with his father after her divorce. He is now 25, but refuses to see her. She's given up hope, or almost. I'm hoping that he will start seeing the rational things about this and he's going to start remembering because his memories from his childhood is just corrupted right now but i'm also worried i'm really really worried that he's really damaged and he's hurting i'm worried what's going to happen when he starts thinking um is this going to be okay or not is he going to make it so it's both ways somehow i want him to come back but what is that going to do with him Maybe he's better off not knowing? No. No, okay, no. sorry. He's not. But, but when, what's going to happen? Because he's got this healing journey hasn't even started yet. People don't think it can happen. No. I think it's really, really dangerous if people think they get really scared when they think about this. Can you lose a child even though you're good and you're a mum? 
that's not going to happen. People have an opinion that it should be so strong, the love between a mother and a child, it couldn't be happening unless the mother is really, really, really bad. Mm. Really bad. Mm. But that's not the truth. For any parent to lose contact with a child, to think that your child has rejected you, hates you, is the most heartbreaking thing you can imagine. Last October, CAFCAS, the Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service, decided to issue special guidelines on parental alienation. They want it to be part of every social worker's training. Sarah Parsons, Deputy Director of CAFCAS. We're saying that it's important to not over-identify it, but not to be blind to it either. We need to understand each child's experience. And in the most extreme cases, alienation, which is a, a sort of a psychological manipulation of a child, leading to an unjustified rejection by a child of one parent, can be very harmful. It can have lifelong consequences. So it's important that our social workers identify it as early as possible and help the court to work out what would be the best plan for a child. And I think it's an area that the more we talk about it, the better because it's a hidden form of harm, something that's not easily recognised or understood. It's not obvious, it's not visible. There are no obvious psychological or emotional markers. So it's hard for people to reach a clear understanding of what's happening. One thing that stayed with me is I just can't cry and I don't think I've cried in about 15 years. If I ever get into a stage where I feel hurt or emotionally vulnerable through the divorce and the coping mechanisms, I've kind of tricked myself and I had to trick my brother into this at the time. I remember saying to him when he was really down, just look at your hands a minute. And I would just add living at the time. I said, look at your hands when he was about nine. And he said, what? And I said, look, you've got yourself. You're fine. You don't need anyone. We don't need to worry about what they're doing because no matter what situation you're in, you've got your limbs and everything in the internal world is sacred to you and you can stay there. So whenever there comes a time that's emotional or that normally you would surrender yourself to a feeling, I feel like there's, I don't know if it's cynicism or I don't know if it's the defense mechanism but I kind of flip inside and I'm just like, no, I'm fine. I'm actually fine. This doesn't affect me in any way. It's funny because you talk about not crying and a number of times I felt hearing you, listening to you, I probably could cry. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing because that wouldn't be very professional, but yeah. I feel there are feelings in you that could come out as tears if you had access to it. Yeah, and that does upset me because I feel like... I don't know, it feels like I'm missing out on something. But I don't know, I just have this cut off. Now you are an adult, what would you say to the young Sam, the young you? What yeah. would you say to that nine-year-old boy? I would like to say be more vocal, but that's not relevant or wasn't really possible in that scenario as far as I see it. I mean, what can you do when you're 10 years old and half the size of both your parents? What would you say now as an adult to each of your parents, say, 10, 15 years ago when you were in the thick of it? Please try to reconcile it in any way you can or please try to be as affable as possible, even if it's difficult, because that difficulty that you would bear by doing that would possibly erase difficulty in my life and my brother's life forever. I'd like to take those words of Sam's and repeat them again. Be as affable as you can. The difficulty you bear by doing that would erase difficulty in my life and my brother's life forever. It's dreadful for the child if one parent is demonised, because however inadequate that parent is, it's still half the child's makeup. So how can a child make sense of half of themselves being evil? The psychological effects of these extreme parental battles are profound. Karen Woodall is a psychotherapist who co-founded the Family Separation Clinic, a private therapy clinic in London which attempts to reunite children with their parents. She spelled out for me the psychological processes that lead to alienation. They have to split the experience of their parents into all good 
and all bad. It's a defence which protects them from the dynamics. And so splitting is very much a presentation where a child will say, mum is wholly bad, dad is wholly bad good and here is the evidence and they'll give you a whole list of things which proves in inverted commas that this is true and um, one of my favorites is I'm never going to see my dad again because he takes me to my grandma's and when she makes lasagna she puts beans in it the other one is I'm never going to see my mum again because she makes me eat broccoli and when you press the child well, isn't that what mums do? They make you eat things that you don't like. Yes, but broccoli makes me very, very ill, and my mum knows that. So there's a theme of escalation. They'll start with a small thing, but if you don't show a sufficient reaction, they'll escalate that. So it'll start with my mum makes me eat broccoli to broccoli makes me very, very ill yes. to I am allergic to broccoli yes. to my mum wants to kill me. Exactly. And depending on how the person that's interacting with the child responds, that child will do that quickly or will do it over time. So what we find when we're working with children is that they will try it on and if we're not biting, if we're not falling for it, they'll pull it back a bit. But in some circumstances, particularly with social workers who are trained to follow the voice of the child, you can go from, my mum makes me eat broccoli, to my mum tried to kill me within five minutes because the child recognises in the person that's listening that there's someone here that they can hook into and that that narrative is producing a reaction. And once they're into that feedback loop, then all bets are off. It can go anywhere. I suppose to some extent they were trying to substantiate their emotional state which was extreme by making up a story that fitted how they felt so being torn apart by two parents having to go from enemy camp to enemy camp and change from enemy to friend splits them so much that to make sense of how torn apart they feel so someone can understand it they talk in the language of sensation that makes adults sit up and take notice. And the tragedy, really, is that many of these cases happen by accident but end up in a very severe situation where the child will reject a parent for sometimes decades. This goes to the heart of why parental alienation is such a challenging and controversial subject. It challenges the belief that in parental disputes, the voice and wishes of the child are sacrosanct. Dr. Amy Baker. If they've been manipulated, it's not their voice. They're just puppets at that point. And so, no, they shouldn't be given weight. That might not be completely PC, but we don't let children decide whether to wear helmets or seatbelts or whether to go to school or get vaccinated. They can't get married, they can't join the army, they can't do drugs, they can't drop out of school. I mean, there's a million things we know. You know, the teenage brain in particular is hardwired to be very emotionally reactive. So teenagers in particular are highly susceptible to being manipulated. Some parents give up and wait it out. They have no other option. Others who can afford it spend years fighting their case in the courts. Paul has lost his house, his savings, and has had to remortgage his parents' house. He estimates he's spent 86,000 pounds on legal fees, fighting for access to his two children in the family courts and ultimately in the high court. We can't give his real name. These court proceedings are secret and we need to protect his identity because his children are still young, so we've had to disguise his voice to hear his story. Paul and his partner Mary were together for six years, but they weren't married, which made his situation more complicated. At the point where things got really bad, he moved out of the joint home and was living with his parents. I hadn't seen my children for a couple of years, and then lo and behold, in the November, I came back and my mum said, some people at the door, and I went, who? She went, the police. And was it the next morning? There were six police officers in my bedroom. Six? Six. So they came in, I said, what's this regarding? And he went, sit down. I said, what? what? He said, you've been accused of raping your own daughter. 
and they wanted my computers and they wanted my phones and I was I said look take it all it's here it's this take it all I then got taken in the van to a police station at about 6 30 was booked in and I was in that cell for 12 hours it had me on suicide watch they thought I was going to kill myself it was then that the full extent of the charges against him was revealed Paul's ex-partner accused him of raping the children injecting drugs into their eyeballs murdering babies and burying them under the floorboards there was no truth no evidence for any of these allegations but paul was on bail for a whole year and was almost driven mad by it i started to believe the allegations you know when you're sleeping in the middle of the night you're running the, it, you're, it's just unbelievable you know people say that i'm strong-willed broad-shouldered i think i am but that, that's seriously dark my criminal solicitor at the time said well, police will come to your place of work they will kick the door down and they will do it in front of all your colleagues so every time somebody walked past me i can't explain it to you that anxiety your heart is in your chest in your throat paul didn't in fact lose his job and he's been totally cleared of all these charges before the criminal case could be heard he paid for a barrister and went to court to fight for access to his children. And the phone rang and the solicitor started smiling. She goes, I think you need to take this call. And it was the investigating police officer. And he said that the charges are dropped. And I just burst out crying. I just lost it. It was like a wave of relief. And it just, yeah, it just all came back together. But it's now, they've been living with me for three years, going through the allegations. My brother's children were interviewed. My good mate's children were interviewed. And it puts pressure, it breaks families. And it's fundamentally broken my family. It's difficult. When my daughter first came to live with me, she was having phenomenally vocal night terrors. This is not in any way a parent bleating. It is, for me, the main reason why I was willingly happy to come here today was about the kids. This is about the kids, not about parents. You make your bed, you line it, you pick your partner, that's life. But using kids as collateral is unforgivable. In my view, unforgivable. I didn't know anything about parental alienation when I started making this programme. And my mind has been sort of blown by it. Because I used to think that there was no smoke without fire when it came to allegations. But I have learnt there really is. Because in the winning-losing dynamic that two ex-partners can get into, they can hurl allegations that have no basis in truth at each other because of their belief that they need to get at their partner and they will use their children to do it. And it's horrific. What typically does not work, and unfortunately what's done in most situations, is send the child and the target parent to some sort of therapeutic intervention. Ashish Joshi is a lawyer who specializes in parental alienation cases and practices in the United States and India. Traditional therapy usually does not work. It doesn't work and it causes damage, in fact. It takes a bad case and converts it into a worst case possible because the therapists are trained to validate feelings. And in an alienation situation, those feelings are not founded in reality. They're distortions. So a child could say, I hate you because you were abusive to me. And the child could have appropriate affect with that, tears, hysteria. And the therapist then turns to the parent and say, don't contradict the child, show some empathy, look at the tears, and just tell him or her you are sorry. That doesn't work in an alienation case. It would absolutely help if alienation would be termed as a felony. But what would probably help more is the education for the social workers for the judges, for the lawyers who grapple with this question day in and day out. Because uh, it's easy to just yell and scream alienation. It's another thing to prove it in a court of law. Proving it in a court of law is fraught and complex because no one wants to risk missing a genuine case of abuse. I asked lawyer Francesca Wiley how you decipher which cases are real parental abuse and which are merely alleged and possibly untrue. Evidence 
I mean, the best thing you can do is to look for evidence and to also look at the history of a case. There must be cases where people have alleged parental alienation and it's not true. Do you work for both sides? Yes, always. I represent both sides. And that's interesting because I'm going to be general here, but for example, a sexual abuse case where a mother is saying something like, my four-year-old has been sexually abused during contact. And you know it can't really be true because we've got two grandparents and an auntie who are present at the time that she says the abuse happened or something like that. They're really sophisticated cases and it's important to look closely at what's going on. And I think it does come down fundamentally to a thorough analysis of their mental health and their psychological functioning. But that needs to be done in a sophisticated way and in a thorough way. And sometimes we don't have experts who are able to do that. And the other problem we've got is that you're paying. In private law, you've got to pay. So it's very difficult to get legal aid. The reality is you're going to have to fund experts to do that sort of thing. And it's tricky. So really this expert witness won't be available to people who can't afford it? No. So we're short of experts? Yes, absolutely. And we're desperately short of experts that don't cost money? Very much so. I keep wanting to come back to the children caught up in these toxic triangles of lies and blame. Making this programme has reminded me of the power we have as parents. We hold such sway over our children's impressionable minds that has consequences for the whole of the rest of their lives. Sam certainly feels that the trauma of his parents' divorce has made it almost impossible for him to commit to any loving relationship. I find that in my relationships they oftentimes come to a stalemate where I won't continue with it because I think, OK, the next step is for me to be completely vulnerable. But if I am completely vulnerable, I could be taken advantage of again. So has that made relationships difficult for you now? I would say so, yes, because I find it really, really difficult to say love or, like, to tell someone I love them. And if I do, I feel like it's a massive betrayal to them because in my own head everything's so interchangeable and I'm not sure. I don't have the conviction to say it. Interchangeable because you're so used to agreeing to two polarised points of view, yeah. your mother's and your father's. Yeah, like so so used to being passed from one to the other one. You keep this barrier around yourself at all times to prevent something like divorce happening again. Because you've seen how ugly a separation can be. Thank you.